Ethiopian Jews trace their history to what is today northern Sudan and are also known as the Falashas and Beta Israel. Are they descendants of Solomon or Dan? In this session, we're going to examine the history of the Beta Israel, aka Ethiopian Jews. We want to look at the theories about their origins because there are conflicting stories about their ancestral roots. Some say that they are descended from King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, also known as Makeda, while other stories claim that they are the descendants from the tribe of Dan. Which one is it? The Ethiopian Jews refer to themselves as the Beta Israel or the House of Israel. And it's interesting that they speak of themselves as the whole House of Israel and not as one of the tribes of Israel. So a lot of people may be wondering why were they living in Sudan? Historical writings say that before many of them were carried to the Jewish state of Israel, they lived in villages near the mountainous region of Lake Tana in Sudan, in close proximity with Christian and Muslim populations. Based on this information from BBC.com, Sudan's history goes back to the Pharaonic period. It was one of the largest and one of the most geographically diverse states in Africa until it split into two countries in 2011 after southern Sudan voted for independence. So after the secession, it was no longer the largest country by area in Africa and the Arab League. However, its population is one of the most diverse on the African continent. You have two distinct major cultures, Arab and Black African, but these are dark melanated people. Yet there are hundreds of ethnic and tribal subdivisions and language groups which make effective collaboration among them a major political challenge. It's important to note that when they refer to them as Ethiopian Jews, they are referring to a small sect living in that area. The boundaries separating these countries were created by outside sources. But you can clearly see how close they are. So the Beta Israel migrated to Sudan. The same thing happened to our people. We migrated into West Africa, and that is where our ancestors were when they were taken up in the slave trade, but it's not the place of origin. Now, to the non-Jewish Ethiopians, the Beta Israel are also known as the Falasha, meaning strangers in the ancient and local language of Ge'ez. Why? Because they didn't fit in with the native people where they lived in Northeast Africa. As mentioned, some traditions say that they are the descendants of the lost tribe of Dan, yet others claim that they are the descendants of the son born to Solomon and Sheba. So which is it? Let's dig a little deeper. We will begin by looking at sources establishing the fact that inhabitants from ancient Israel did indeed live on the continent of Africa. This reference is from a book called An Account of Timbuktu and Hausa, Territories in the Interior of Africa. The stated date for publication is 1820. The excerpt I'm sharing here can be found on page 475 of the book, but I also inserted the statement from the author, James G. Jackson, to show that he took issue with how European travelers to Africa misconstrued words and applied incorrect meaning to things because of their ignorance of the language. We're still trying to make sense of their errors. So here he says, I shall state some examples in recent publications. 
and he tells the reader that the error is found on page 187 of the publication he's referring to. Now here on page 475, he clears up the confusion about the word Jew versus Yehudi. So listen, he says, Yehudi, a place of great trade. This place is reported to be inhabited by one of the lost tribes of Israel, possibly an immigration from the tribe of Judah. Yehuda in African Arabic signifies Judah. So Yehuda means Judah. And then he says Yehudi signifies Jew. So they are using Jew when it should be Yehudi. So he says it is not impossible that many of the lost tribes of Israel may be found dispersed in the interior regions of Africa when we shall become better acquainted with that continent. He says it is certain that some of the nations that possess the country eastward of Palestine when the Israelites were a favored nation have immigrated to Africa. Let's look at another source. The name of this book is West African Countries and Peoples, British and Native, with the requirements necessary for establishing that self-government recommended by the Committee of the House of Commons 1865. And it says, A Vindication of the African Race. This was written by James Africanus. So it says, from a little study of the ethnology of the language of Western Africa and the Hebrew tongue, one is involuntarily brought to trace out a similarity in one of them to that of the tribes, which from disobedience to the will of God were dispersed, and the greatest number of them possibly went to Africa. Then he says, I mean, the lost tribes of Israel. Now I'm going to back up to pages 188 through 189 of the same book to share this excerpt. It says, in those early days, Africa was known and famous amongst the then civilized portion of the world. So when did it become uncivilized? When Europeans said so. Let's read it again. Africa was known and famous amongst the then civilized portion of the world, and the Assyrians and Babylonians were among its earliest conquerors, so that about 67 years after the destruction of the temple, we are told in Esther 1 that Ahasuerus, the king of Assyria, reigned from India unto Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces. It goes on and it says, And since the king of Egypt was considered lord of the people of Ethiopia or Sudan, we read in Isaiah that the king of Assyria led away the Ethiopians captive, young and old, naked and barefooted to the shame of Egypt. It says, Northern Egypt then was the most known portion of the globe, and into it... Vast immigration took place from time to time, even to the most remote period. It says the ten tribes of Israel, after they were left to follow the dictates of their own mind, and during the commotion and destructive warfare which ensued to escape utter extermination, migrated according to the usage of times, according to the usage of the times, it says, in vast numbers into various countries, but principally into northern Africa, as it then presented, listen, the safest and easiest route. Once settled, every commotion and intestine war had the most powerful effect 
of inducing these migratory bands to shift their abode still further and so lose all connection with the other branch of the tribe. As hundreds of years pass on and generation after generation roll away, they lose a great many of their habits and customs, becoming more amalgamated with the population with which they associate. But when Mohammedism overspread North Africa, destroying by fire and sword all those of another religion, listen, the Israelitish descendants or the inhabitants occupying the central portion of Africa passed forward, seeking shelter to the south and west, a part namely those from the east central crossing the Banu or Jaliba branch of the Niger, descended gradually southward and became intermingled with the original inhabitants. Protected from incursion on the north by the Banu River and quietly settled between the Great Niger and Old Calabar Rivers, they remained in peace and grew from one generation to another in idolatry, but still leaving tangible proofs in the form of their religion to the Judaistic origin of the inhabitants. Listen, after this slight digression, we will now proceed to investigate more particulars relative to the tribes under consideration, the language or the little of it that is known is full of Hebraisms. So a lot of this happened after the dispersion in AD 70 and before. The Romans were chasing the Israelites after 70 AD. Why would they run into an area where people are there who don't look like them? No, they fled into Africa because the people had the same hue. So we have to ask, is it impossible for the Beta Israel who were living in Ethiopia to be true descendants of the ancient Israelites? So let's look at some sources to see if we can determine who these people really are. This comes from Genetic Literacy Project. It says the conventional theory among historians today attributes the origin of the Ethiopian Jews to a separatist movement that branched out of Christianity and adopted Judaism between the 14th and 16th centuries. The theory essentially holds the Ethiopian Jews to be the descendants of indigenous non-Jewish Ethiopians and their belief in ancient Jewish descent to be just a matter of myth and legend. So the author is saying scholars and historians in particular have been steered to ignore the compelling evidence for the ancient origins of the group. So the author says, I will present the historical evidence, which with the support of crucial genetic findings strongly suggests that today's Ethiopian Jews are the descendants of an ancient Jewish population. So it says this study reinforces recent reviews of the DNA studies of the Ethiopian Jews that have already pointed to major flaws in the traditional historical perspective. Furthermore, the latest research further suggests a strong historical affiliation between the Ethiopian Jews and Northern Sudan that is little discussed in literature. So let's drop down and talk about the Beta Israel. It says, until they were forced to leave Ethiopia in the 1980s, Ethiopian Jews lived in small villages scattered in the northwestern region of the Ethiopian plateau around Lake Tana 
and in the Simeon Mountains area. They traditionally referred to themselves as the Beta Israel and were referred to by other Ethiopians as Falasha, meaning strangers in the indigenous Semitic language Ge'ez. Thus, the term Beta Israel or Beta Israel will be used throughout this article to label the community. So he sets out to try to prove that these people are who they say they are. It says the community has venerated the Old Testament of the Ethiopian Bible and its religious language has been Ge'ez. Today, the Beta Israel show closest resemblance in external cultural characteristics to their surrounding Habash, i.e. the ethnic category that encompasses the Amhara and the Tigray Tigrinya populations. And although both the Habash Christians and the Beta Israel claim royal descent from the time of King Solomon and Queen Sheba, an important difference exists. While the Christians claim descent from King Menelik, the offspring of Solomon and Sheba in Ethiopia, the Beta Israel claim descent from first generation Israelites from the tribe of Dan, who some believe accompanied Menelik as guards of honor. So this is what they're saying about themselves, that they are descendants of Dan. It goes on to say, the geographical definition of Ethiopia in historical sources must be addressed, for it has distorted major studies on the history of the region. It wasn't until recently that scholars realized that the name Ethiopia in ancient and medieval sources denoted the Nile Valley civilization of Cush also known today as ancient Nubia in what is today northern Sudan. On the other hand, the geographical area that encompasses the modern country of Ethiopia had in the past housed the ancient kingdom of Aksum, which developed in the northern parts of the plateau and was sometimes referred to as Abyssinia. It is also worth mentioning that all of the biblical and a significant portion of the ancient references to Ethiopia or Cush predate the establishment of Aksum in the first century CE. Now let's make sure we understand what the author said. He said it was the Christians saying that these people descended from Solomon, but the people say they are descendants of Dan. Let's go back to the article. So the author here says, as I have argued in a former paper, analyzing the history of the Beta Israel within the boundaries of the contemporary country of Ethiopia is a problematic approach. Why? Because the political boundaries of the modern day countries of Sudan and Ethiopia were only defined towards the early 20th century. However, even after the boundaries were specified, the Beta Israel settlements remained at the periphery and far from the interior of today's Ethiopia which is close to the western border region with northern Sudan. So he says, in order to trace the origin of the Beta Israel, we must start where? In northern Sudan. Because he says, this is where the oldest evidence for Jews in the Horn of Africa points. He says this is not only important because of the geographical relevance between the Beta Israel and Cush, but also because of the immense evidence that link between the two. 
He goes on to say the history of the Beta Israel in context of their neighboring ancient land of Cush in what is today northern Sudan has surprisingly not been the subject of a serious investigation. And I wonder why. I wonder why. So he says Kessler is one of very few contemporary scholars who has attempted to elaborate on the connection between the Beta Israel and Cush and has recognized the tendency among scholars to underrate the significance of the impact of ancient Egypt and of Nubia or Moreau on development of the African Horn region. He goes on to say references to Cush appear in the Bible as well as in extra biblical narratives and traditions. He says the Bible mentions directly the presence of Jews in Cush and he references the book of Zephaniah that states from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia meaning Cush my worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offerings. This is Zephaniah 3.10. He also refers to Psalm 87.4 and Isaiah 11.11 11 to say those references make the same indication. It says the identification of the Beta Israel with Cush is best illustrated in the writings of Jewish scholar and traveler Eldad Hadani in the 9th century. Eldad identifies himself as being a citizen of an independent Jewish state beyond the rivers of Cush. He also identified himself as being of an Israelite origin from the tribe of Dan and thus his last name, Hadani. Eldad's geographical affiliation and identification with the tribe of Dan strongly corroborate with what is known of the Beta Israel. So according to Eldad, he says from the time when they left the land of Israel, passed through Egypt, and finally settled down in the land of Cush, he says the inhabitants of Cush didn't prevent them from dwelling there because they took the land by force. And it says the fact that Eldad identifies his people with Cush and not with Aksum demonstrates the very strong historical identity bond that ties between the Beta Israel and northern Sudan. Another source corroborating this is the 15th century scholar Obadiah ben Abraham of Bertinoro, who discusses trade relations between the Beta Israel and Cush. He's quoted as saying, they believe themselves to be the descendants of the tribe of Dan. And they say that the pepper and other spices which the Cushites sell come from their land. Let's go on. Continuing, it says, finally, in context of our search for the historical and possibly genealogical connections between the Beta Israel and northern Sudan, an important point regarding the physical features of the group must be made. Contrary to what is commonly assumed, and as I stressed formally in an essay, the Beta Israel do not really look like their surrounding non-Jewish Ethiopians. So the author is saying that there are certain features distinguishing them from the native Sudanese populations around them. The author goes on to talk about Eldad and his references to the descendants of one of the lost tribes living beyond the rivers of Cush during the 19th century and he places them in the same Lake Tana area mentioned previously. He also points to writings from the 12th century by Benjamin Tildila appearing to corroborate Eldad's account by mentioning independent Israelite cities in eastern Africa. He is quoted as saying, there are high mountains there and there are Israelites there and the Gentile yoke is not upon them. 
So the author references another historical source describing the Jewish queen Judith. It is said that she came from a region west of Axum and ruled Axum in the late 9th or 10th century. So he concludes by saying, given the various references for Jewish presence in the region across the centuries, there appears to be no persuasive reason to assume that the Beta Israel have emerged as recently as the 14th to 16th centuries. It is also very unreasonable to suggest that all such historical references to Jewish presence in the designated regions which greatly correspond with the historical and cultural context of the contemporary Beta Israel are coincidental. Now let's look at another source from March of 1949, and this was written by Wolf LaSalle. It says, The Black Jews of Ethiopia, an expedition to the Falashas. He says, in 1946, I undertook a scientific expedition under the joint auspices of the Guggenheim Foundation and the Viking Fund to study the languages, folklore, and traditional history of Ethiopia. In the course of this expedition, I decided to include a special survey of the Falashas, Ethiopia's famed black Jews, who for centuries have lived in the most remote areas of the country. It says, until recently, the Falashas believed themselves to be the sole surviving Jews of the world. And since their rediscovery in the 18th century, they have constituted an unending mystery to the scientific investigator. Everything concerning their origin and historical past is a matter of speculation or is a matter for speculation. Whether they are ethnically Jews, whence and when they migrated to Ethiopia, or on the other hand, whether they represent a part of the native Ethiopian population which was converted at some remote time to Judaism, and if so, by whom? All of these problems still go unsolved. From the available evidence, only one thing is clear. Their Judaism seems to date from some time before the compilation of the Mishnah and the Talmud, for they are completely ignorant of all the religious writings of the period since the dispersion. Continuing on, it says the Old Testament and especially the apocryphal book of Jubilees constitute the chief sources of Falasha religious law and precept. Both of these works, along with their religious literature, are written in the language of Gez or Old Ethiopic. So it says, as mentioned, Falasha Judaism is completely pre-dispersion and therefore the Talmud or any of the other post-biblical literary works, with the exception of fragmentary pieces of Apocrypha, are unknown. So it says the Falasha only venerate the handwritten copy of the Torah and unlike Western Jewry, do not think it sinful to place the copy of the Torah on the floor or to allow any member of the community, priest or layman, to touch it. It goes on to say, the sacred copy of the Torah is read aloud on the Sabbath and the high holidays, and since it is written in Gez, a language not understood by the ordinary Falasha, the priest, must compose a running translation of the text into Amharic, the spoken language. Continuing, it says, all the cardinal points of Falasha belief and ritual can be traced to this body of religious writings. Now, this is their belief. Listen, here they say, 
the Falashas fervently believe in the God of Israel, the invisible, the creator of heaven and earth, and with obvious Christian undertones in a paradise and a hell, in angels and the last judgment. They also believe that they have their own Messiah, whose name is Theodore, and who descends directly from the house of David. It says, before the Messiah's coming, the Falashas prophecy, all countries, or the Falashas prophesy, that all countries will engage in universal war. At the end of this war, the Messiah will appear and reign in Ethiopia for 40 years before proceeding to Palestine. It says, it is, however, in their festivals and fast days that the Falashas show their greatest divergence from the Ethiopians, having weekly, monthly, lunar, and yearly festivals and fasts. Some of the lunar festivals are celebrated only as reminders of the main festivals. It talks about the festival con corresponding to Rosh Hashanah, it's called the light has appeared and is celebrated on the first day of the seventh moon. The feast of harvest is celebrated the twelfth day of the third moon. The people bring to the synagogue measures of grain or baked bread and the priests bless it. Now listen, it says the first and last days of the Passover celebration, as well as of the feast of tabernacles, are named the holy and no work or travel of any kind is permitted. As for the rest of Passover, work is also prohibited, though Falashas may travel to other villages to visit relatives or friends. Throughout Passover, the Falashas cannot eat anything that is leavened or fermented. At the close of the festival, the newly brewed beer and newly baked bread are brought to the synagogue as offerings to the priest. Now it continues by saying many Falasha customs are merely variations of customs practiced by the Ethiopians, yet several bear distinctly indigenous features. For example, it talks about the birth of a child. It says, as soon as the woman begins her labor, she must enter, accompanied by two midwives, the hut of blood or malediction, a special hut constructed on the outskirts of the village. If the child is a male, he is circumcised on the eighth day, and the parents donate a sum of money to the priest. Meanwhile, the mother must remain for seven days in this hut and can eat anything but meat. She remains in this hut for 14 days if the child is a female, and on leaving it performs the ritual evolutions. Now it says the Falashas, though having much the same food as the Ethiopians, observe the prescriptions of the Bible with great strictness, and eat only those animals that chew to cud and are cloven. They are also scrupulous about washing their hands before and after every meal, as is the case with the other Ethiopians, and pronouncing the benediction over all their food. The Falashas do not eat raw meat or animals that have died natural deaths and observe a very detailed set of taboos against the invasion of such practices. Despite the increased knowledge of the Falashas and their problems on the part of Western Jewry, it says they still live in relative isolation. Even many Ethiopians, especially those in regions where there are no Falashas, are not aware of their existence. So as a group, they're seeing, seen as being separate from the populations around them. So much so that the Ethiopians, the other Ethiopians, call them at tenkun, meaning do not touch me, T 
to describe them. So it talks about them not participating in the larger sects of societies. And, the, and few of them, it says, ever see foreign newspapers. And even if they did, they wouldn't be able to read it, most of them. So again, there are many explanations for their origins. There are those who believe they descend from Solomon. Others say, no, they came from the tribe of Dan. And then there are those who say, no, these are converts. Now we'll look at an excerpt from this article from the Jerusalem Post entitled The Beta Israel, The Return of a Lost Tribe. Now, this says the history of Ethiopian Jewry goes back millennia. Millennia? Then why are these folks gaslighting us when we dare to say that the original Israelites were a dark, melanated people? It says for almost 2,000 years, the Beta Israel had their own community, even their own kingdom and army in the Simeon Mountains region of Ethiopia. It says while the Beta Israel was cut off from the rest of the Jewish world, indeed, they believed they were among the only Jews left on earth after the temple's destruction. It says slowly word of their existence began to filter out. Listen, Marco Polo and Benjamin of Tudela wrote of the existence of an independent Jewish nation, a Mosaic kingdom lying on the other side of the rivers of Ethiopia. Eldad Hadani, a 9th century merchant and traveler, told at length the story of the lost tribes of Israel, including that of an ancient tribe of Dan who lived in Cush, the land of gold mentioned in the first book of the Torah. They had the five books of Moses, he reported, but not the Talmud we have today. It goes on. It says, throughout the centuries, the Beta Israel fought numerous wars against other tribes throughout Ethiopia, some Christian, others Muslim, and were subjected to numerous attempts to forcibly convert them. Many were killed or sold into slavery. One adversary who sought to subjugate them, the emperor Zara Yaqob, who reigned from 1434 to 1468, even proudly added the title exterminator of the Jews to his name. Yet despite all the efforts to eliminate the community and horrendous hardships, the Beta Israel survived and clung to their tradition. So it goes on to say that the matter is well known that there are perpetual wars between the kings of Cush, listen, which has three kingdoms, the Ishmaelites, the Christians, and the Israelites from the tribe of Dan. How interesting. It says, in the mid-19th century, the Beta Israel population was estimated to number about 250,000 people, a number that would be greatly reduced by the famine of 1882 through 1892. But Western missionary organizations began an intensive drive to convert them to Christianity. So the London Society for Promoting Christianity Amongst the Jews began operating in Ethiopia in 1859. These Protestant missionaries who worked under the direction of a converted Jew named Henry Aaron Stern converted many of the Beta Israel community to Christianity but also provoked a strong response from European Jewry. And I'm sure many of you heard about Operation Solomon. It says from Ethiopian Jews to Ethiopian Israelis. So it says the Beta Israel exodus to Israel began in the early 1980s after a coup 
and the Ethiopian government led to the death of 2,500 of them, directly followed by Ethiopia forbidding the practice of Judaism and the teaching of Hebrew. This was the start of various operations conducted by the state of Israel to rescue the Beta Israel community. So they came up with Operation Solomon, which was a plan to basically get them out of Ethiopia and take them into Israel. And some of this, it was like a clandestine affair where they would swoop in, grab these people, and then they'd get out of there before the Ethiopian government knew that they were gone. So we're still left with the question, are they descended from Dan or Solomon? Because of course you know that being a descendant of Solomon would give them the potential right to rule. This information comes from Wayne State University Press. It says the DNA samples taken from the Falasha and Ethiopian Jews were studied with the Y chromosome specific DNA probe and it was determined that they descended from ancient inhabitants of Ethiopia who converted to Judaism. And you know why, right? <laughs> because their Y DNA did not match that of the Ashkenazi. And you have to ask, why would it? They're not the same people. One descends from the Japhetic line, and science has proven that they are Europeans. And that makes it even more puzzling as to why they made an exception for these dark melanated people claiming to be descendants of the ancient Israelites to come there. When they looked at the genetic studies, it's basically proving what a lot of us have been saying, that the folks who say they are us are Indo-Europeans. So the results that you see here group them in their people groups like Russia, Poland, the Baltic states, Romania, Ukraine, and so on, because it's based on their DNA. So this chart is a great visual to show that those from the original people groups, the melanated folks, include Sub-Saharan Africans and the people we're focusing on in the session, the Ethiopian Jews in addition to Moroccans, Egyptians, Libyans, etc. They are grouped within their shared population. Listen to what it says. It says even groups that fell outside of the shared Jewish population cluster identified by PCA such as Ethiopian Beta Israel, Yemenite, Indian B'nai Israel, and Indian Cochin Jews form their own subclusters, indicating that they were distinct, homogeneous populations. They're not the same people. So the next closest group related to us are the Bedouins, the Yemeni Jews, Palestinians, and so on. But where do you see the people who say they are us? Right at the top with the other Europeans. So if you're just wondering why other Europeans fail to disclose who those people really are, it's because they know that they are all the same people. Now, in light of all of that, you have to wonder why they took them to the state of Israel. And there is yet another angle that we need to explore. Some of you may have already heard that the Ethiopians say they have the Ark of the Covenant. This comes from the New York Post. It says Christians in Ethiopia never saw Ark of the Covenant they died for. So it says, they were slaughtered trying to stop real-life raiders of the lost ark, an artifact so powerful and holy they were forbidden from ever seeing it. 
It says the harrowing mass murder of at least 800 people at an Ethiopian church in Tigray highlighted the apparent whereabouts of the Ark of the Covenant, one of the biggest mysteries in religion and the stuff of movie legend. This is the Ark, a large gold-covered wooden chest said to hold Moses' Ten Commandments, was held at the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem for centuries, but vanished after Jerusalem was sacked in 586 or 587 BC, according to the Old Testament. But listen, since then, its whereabouts have remained unknown with rumors including it being stolen by Knights Templar and hidden in a rebuilt French cathedral, as well as it being buried alongside Alexander in Greece. But this is where it gets interesting. It says, Ethiopia's Orthodox Christians have long maintained that the Ark has been held in a chapel at the Church of St. Mary of Zion in the holy northern city of Axum. It says, according to legend, the Ark was brought to Ethiopia in the 10th century BC after being stolen by the staff of Menelik, the son of Queen of Sheba and King Solomon of Israel, who deemed the theft was permitted by God because none of his men were killed. The ark is said to be so dangerous it was always covered while moved, and in Axum only virgin monks ordained to be its keeper are allowed to look at it. The story is rather interesting. So we're going to dig a little deeper into this. We do know that Ethiopians are represented in scripture, so there is a history there. Psalm 68:31 says, Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto Yah. Now the history extended even into the New Testament. We see in Acts 8:27 the story about Philip ministering to an Ethiopian eunuch. It says, And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. You have to ask yourself, why would a high ranking official serving under the queen of Ethiopia, overseeing her entire treasury, make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem to worship? during Passover. And let's remember that historically, Ethiopia referred to the kingdom of Cush in the region of what is now Sudan. Why is that country playing such a pivotal role in the Abraham Accords peace treaty? So again, there is more to cover, particularly as it pertains to their descent from either Dan or Solomon. And again, not all of them, but a sect of them. So there are major things to consider if it's either one of them. Hopefully this message has been a blessing to you. Remember to hit the like, share, and you are welcome to subscribe if you have not already done so. Join me next time.